another Alice interview with Professor Thomas Valgren and uh, he is a professor at the University of Helsinki and uh, the director of uh, the Van Wright and Van, Van Wright and Wittgenstein uh, archives. archives. That's correct. Uh, thank you very much for being here, for being guest of uh, the Alice interview. Um, today you um, introduced us to your theory of um, polycentric modernity, yes. which was uh, really inspiring for us. And uh, we have many things in common um, here in Coimbra, the work we do uh, with your theory. Um, and uh, I would like to explore it a bit more, in particular uh, the concept of polycentrism of modernity. Mm -hmm. um, Boventura de Sosa Santos, the director of our center and the director of uh, the project, Alice, uh, speaks about uh, insurgent cosmopolitanism, which I think is a concept uh, that could be interesting to um, put into the question of uh, polycentric modernity, meaning the cosmopolitanism that uh, emerge from the periphery even of the world system. Yeah, thank you very much. It's such a pleasure to be here with the Alice Project, uh, which is also a very inspiring, very successful thing. Uh, maybe I can start with saying where I think there are two very fundamental uh, familiarities or things that resonate with me that I see at work here in the Alice Project and the work of Boventura and, 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 and his colleagues, uh, you included. Uh, one is this uh, uh, idea that in order to have uh, responsible a responsible political imagination, uh, a political imagination which is up to the tasks of our times, we need to conceive the political dynamics, dynamics of globalization as a cultural dynamics, as a civilizational dynamics, uh, not only as the more short-term economic, which is also of course part of the agenda. So this idea of cultural politics uh, I think is very central. Uh, another common concern uh, is this necessity of of a north-south dialogue and also the south-south dimension of the dialogue that we need in order to regain a responsible politics in the north we need to have we need to be partners of this intercontinental uh, dialogues so these are some of the uh, this is the framework uh, in which I feel myself at home and in that framework I think one thing which is very uh, the, the first thing uh, that comes out which is uh, a, a moral asset and a political asset is that when we have this framework of the domestic dialogue and the and the civilizational uh, underpinnings of our uh, political challenges, then uh, it gives uh, a time frame which is which gives hope, because in the short term, all of us I think in all part corners of the globe are very much burdened by the fact that things are changing fast. Uh, even it's very chaotic. And very bad things can happen very quickly. Not only the, the nuclear war, but also the climate collapse and the finance collapse. We're, uh, we're facing uh, very sort of immediate threats. Uh, and that leads to, uh, that very easily leads to a short circuit in political imagination that the only response which is possible is a quick response. And then there's very little time for democratic reflection, building of democratic responses. And I think, uh, I think this is uh, bad for the emancipatory uh, politics and it's bad also for seeing for one's citizens' responsibility to have this sense of, of panic, this is time, time shortage. And in this, in this context I thought it would be pleasant for me uh, as a newcomer to the conversation to present how I see with my Eurocentric lenses, because I'm from Finland, I've been living almost all my life in Europe, to present my understanding of what is the cultural, what, what are the cultural sources of the sense of, of dead end, what is the uh, what is the cultural diagnosis of the of the uh, challenges, the politics of our times, and then see what does what kind of identity and what kind of tasks this gives to us. So this is why I why I chose this very broad agenda because I thought in this context people will feel this is not irrelevant, mm -hmm. that, that in order to speak about our times, we need to speak about also the long journey and the culture underpinning. So I was very happy to have this opportunity. Thank you very much. It, w it was really inspiring for us as well. Um, 
And you also spoke today about um, the limits of the left, uh, in particular in this moment of uh, economic but mostly political crisis. Uh, my question would be, what do you think the, less, the left should uh, reconsider in terms to approach the crisis dif differently, both uh, in a dialogue between North and South of Europe and in a dialogue between the North and the South of the world? Yeah, I, <clears throat> yeah, I think the... Uh, on the basis of this polycentric diagnosis I have, I see the, there's been a shortcoming in the responses of the left to neoliberal globalization, which have uh, two sources. Uh, one is there's been uh, an uh, under-politicization of, of the question of technology. We've been so much focused on, on the economy that we have not seen the very huge change that technology bring to well to all aspects of life as a political challenge. We have not been sufficiently uh, active on that agenda. And that has to do, I think, with the a more uh, a, a deeper uh, under theorization of of what reason and enlightenment has been in our culture. So that's one uh, that's one aspect. The other uh, I mean, I think, why, have, why has the left not been able to benefit from the crisis that the neoliberal regime has brought, mm -hmm. the financial crisis and ecological crisis? If the crisis is very evident, everybody agrees that there's a crisis. And still, at least in the European context, uh, we have not seen that the left and green spectrum has really been gaining ground in a situation mm -hmm. where the crisis is seen by everyone. So one thing I think is that we have not politicized technology, we have been looking at tech as if a municipality politics could, could could uh, uh, bring uh, justice without also addressing the questions about technology. And that is linked to the second concern I have, which is concerned about democracy, that uh, since the 80s, uh, the intellectuals and the movements, I have been part of the green left spectrum broadly, also social liberal, has been very bothered by the and rightly so, by the increasing power of transnational corporations. I mean, it started in the 60s and 70s, of course. That corporate power is transnational, and therefore we have said we also need to have transnational political governance. And so we have been too quickly supportive of structures like European Union and World Trade Organization because they promise, they have the promise of political governance. And therefore, many in our crowd have been in favor without looking sufficiently into the democratic quality of these institutions. And I think, again, that has been uh, that has been because the left has inherited too much uh, uh, optimism about civilizational progress and too little respect for the local and for the diversity of knowledge, the diversity of cultural aspiration that has local roots. So I think in order to have really rooted democratic responses, uh, there would be a need to, to unite, which is the need to, to control with transnational governance, control uh, transnational corporations. That needs to have more unity with the localization, the, the efforts to defend the autonomy and the integrity of the local in technology, in economy, in politics and in culture. So I think that's my second message to the left, that we need to be more, uh, 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 we need to, to rethink uh, our notion of the relation between the local and the global struggles. And again, this is a thing, I, I know it's a thing that has been discussed a lot here in Coimbra, so maybe what I say is self-evident, but where I come from is not always self-evident. Okay. So probably we should open a dialogue between uh, North and South Europe concerning these things. Uh, a dialogue uh, of different uh, epistemological perspectives that could be embraced in Europe now. For instance, in the morning you spoke about Gandhi and uh, actually I see much of equivalence between what you say about uh, uh, reformulation of the public sphere and the relationship between economics, ethics and uh, politics with what Gandhi used to say. So my question would go uh, into this uh, sphere. I, we know that you work uh, with India for three or four yeah. decades already, so 
what do you think a Gandhian perspective of uh, a political reorganization, which he could not put into practice as we know, uh, could bring now to the debate uh, about uh, the crisis we are facing? It's, uh, it's interesting. Gandhi is a, dif is a difficult name to mention because we know all the critiques of Gandhi and there's been on the anarchist side and the left side and the liberal side, uh, there's been a justified criticism of, of many things of Gandhi said. The feminist movement would be rightly very critical of many right. aspects of Gandhi. I'm more interested in what are the positive things we can learn. After all criticism, what are the things in which Gandhi is interesting? And I think there's two things there. One, it, and this is maybe the most radical aspect, is this idea that uh, the internal connection between the search for truth and, and, and non-violence, that truth is never, uh, truth can never legitimize the use of violence. I think that's a thing which is a bit foreign to the European Enlightenment tradition and, and I think, uh, which I think we can learn a lot from. Uh, then the second thing uh, is that Gandhi is more sensitive than many European idealists are to the limits of human capacity. That uh, 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 when in Gandhi's idea of democracy, where, uh, his word is Faraj, there's, um, there's an idea of uh, that, that in order for people to be, have real autonomy in their lives, the, uh, the complexity can't be too big. So th this is his notion of, lo of localism, which I think has again been, we've been optimistic in the European tradition, optimistic about institutions. And the left has also been optimistic about the institutions. When you have the democratic process, I come from Habermas, I was Habermas in the 1980s in Frankfurt. Habermas, I've learned a lot from him, but I think Habermas is one of those, and he's typical of the Western intellectual of the 20th, 20th century, that we've been optimistic about when the process is democratic, then uh, autonomy will be realized. And I think what we see today with globalization, with, uh, and I mentioned today, the kind of uh, dependency that, for instance, the internet brings. That when, send, when, when we send a satellite, we make a phone call, we, send, we, have, we are dependent on satellite. We're depending on division of labor that reduces lots of people's slavery or conditions of slavery, and slavery was discussed today. And we have an abstract understanding of that, but the, the capacity of us as democratic citizens to really take responsibility for all those complex relations, I think is overburdened. Uh, the, the time we need to understand and to make that understanding resonate emotionally is, is almost infinite and we have difficulties with meeting that challenge. So I think, th so these are the two messages I take from home. One is the, is the necessity of, of considering the, the non-violent aspect of Gandhi and its relation to the search for truth. And the other is this, uh, that democracy may need, may need, uh, a re uh, we need to think of scale of the economy. We need to think of co complexity of division of labor and complexity of technology when we think of, democ uh, of democracy. So these, I think, are, are very important lessons. Whatever else we think about Gandhi, I think those are, uh, are worth our attention. And uh, do you consider that movements uh, such as the Am Admi Party in uh, Delhi that were inspired by Gandhi uh, yeah. in a Gandhian tradition, uh, which is of course debatable, but uh, nonetheless uh, could bring something uh, of this kind to political debate? I look with great hope at, at Ahmadmi. Uh, what I think is interesting with Ahmadmi is that it's a, I mean, it's a very rooted popular protest. It started with, it is true that the success of Ahmadmi is due to the mobilization of ordinary people. People have not found, uh, you know, in the last 20 years when the left has not been producing in India, people have been abandoned, have not found a political uh, well, root of expression. Ahmadmi has brought uh, lots of people uh, with the right and the reason to protest into politics. So that's a big achievement. And the other thing which I th find very promising is, um, in Ahmadmi is this, uh, the way they relate to Gandhi. Everybody can relate to Gandhi. Of course. I just read, you know, wrote. Obama wrote, President Obama wrote a piece in, in Time magazine about Narendra Modi <laughs> as a Gandhian. You know, it's shocking. If, if, if Modi is a Gandhian, 
you know, the name Jesus Christ, because it's, it's it, with the big names you can do all kinds of terrible things. But Ahmad me, as I see it, uh, and, and I know some people there and read some of their stuff, uh, the emphasis they put on radical democracy or what they call Swaraj is, I think, uh, very interesting for all movements who want to see how we can connect the local and the global in a new way. Uh, then I think Ahmad has weaknesses and I think the, the real weak spot, and maybe we see that unfolding now before our, eye, our, our eyes, is that I, don't, I wonder whether the internal democracy of Ahmad Mi. So this is, I think, the problem that, uh, that, uh, that we all have, that there's so many people in the world now who are angered by the consequences of neoliberalism. And people react against corruption and against, uh, and uh, in order, to, and it's very good to mobilize that anger uh, and to fight those bad policies. But still, I'm afraid that we need, uh, and it's also very good that the mobilization comes from the ground. But I think in order for the political response to be sustained and for a more people friendly politics to be sustained, there has to be an articulation also, of not only of the program today, but some kind of systemic analysis of why this program is needed. So, uh, uh, I'm, I think uh, Ahmad may also put here more series. I think uh, uh, their success I congratulate, but I'm afraid we have to, they are only, you know, stepping stones uh, and not yet uh, the new, uh, the new politics of, of this century, that will win this century. That's my, that's my uh, humble guess at this moment. So the weakness seems to be uh, internal democracy. Uh, while they spread uh, news concerning a different model of democracy, and uh, I tend to understand that you see uh, equivalences between the Amadmi and what Podemos and Syriza are doing in uh, in Europe. I would add the Five Star Movement in Italy, mm -hmm. if you would agree. So my question would be, which lessons could uh, uh, reformist or revolutionary or alternative form of politics uh, draw from uh, these movements? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, um, I, I think this is a very big question. I also, uh, also see that these are some of the rays of hope. Ahmad Mi, Podemos, Syriza, Fast Time Movement. Of course, we have the, the uh, popular left in, in Latin America. Right. These are some of the promises of our times. Um, these are the best responses to to the calamities brought by neoliberal globalization that we see, because they are, I mean, they are not. What is distinguishing here is that they are not. Uh, they do not come from the old left organizations, uh, and the old left organizations, which I have great sympathy with and contribute to in some way. Uh, uh, that's part of my life that I contribute also to the old left. But these movements, these organizations uh, have been too complacent, too slow and uh, too close to the neoliberal regime uh, with, of course, bear right. Social democracy in Europe as the pinnacle of this. Uh, so there's been a failure there. So it's very, we absolutely need a different reaction. And then the different reactions must not be the xenophobic, uh, racist, right reaction. So these are the, these are the new this is the new imagination. Uh, my prediction is that the ideology, ideology and the, the articulation of, of what kind of uh, the, 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 the political platform that these movements so far bring, I'm afraid it's not comprehensive enough. enough. It's more reactive to, anti to corruption than constructive in, in how to build a new society. I think the whole it's very, I think we need to rely more on local economy and more local democracies. And the shift away from the global dependence is the more locally ruled life is difficult. Uh, so I don't think these movements yet will have all the answers. What I think we need and what I'll be very interested in hearing and hear to my, uh, that you are doing research on this, we need to know what these movements can learn from each other. We need to look, we need to look at their strengths. What have they done right? And then we also need to look at their weaknesses, uh, because I predict, for instance, Syriza, I hope I'm wrong, that Syriza and Greece will have a very difficult time this summer. 
so we need to look also at what were the limitations if these don't deliver. Because disappointment is very bad in politics. If we have too much hope, too early, in ARP or in cities or in Podemos, and they don't deliver everything we wanted, then we will be disappointed. No, we should not be disappointed. We should look, oh, these movements have been so promising, doing such great work. What can we learn? How can we build from there? That is the, the solidarity I think we would, we'll need to show the next months and the next years. If we put all these movements in common, uh, we could trace their characteristic in the mainstream political discourse as being populist. Although in India probably uh, this word is less used than in Europe. Mm. Uh, but there are elements of the general approach to populism uh, that could be found in all of them. Mm -hmm. um, the first question in that sense would be, do you think that they are the same kind of populism? Because we know that at least in the literature this is, it is recognized that it does exist a right-wing populism and this new form of left-wing populism, which is rooted in, uh, as you mentioned already, in Latin America's mm -hmm. popular movements. Um, and uh, the second question would go much more into, is it populism, taking it also from uh, Ernesto Laclau's studies, uh, is it the term uh, populism used to stigmatize uh, a deepening of democracy, a way to bring a more substantial democracy, which scares the establishment? Um, no, I'm not an expert on, the, on, on what populism is, so I, 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 can't, I can't be helpful on that. Uh, but I do, I, mean, I, I refer to these movements as movements of emancipatory populism, uh, where, where the populist aspect for me has to do with the, uh, with the reactionary quality of the politics, that, that the success is built on a common experience uh, of suffering uh, and the problem is that this suffering must end. We are against the people, we are against the institutions and the people bring us this suffering. Uh, and then uh, there is, I mean, sort of the, uh, in the, in the semantic or in the meaning of the word populist is the idea that people have easy solutions. And of course the easy solution thing is the problem with the populist, whether left wing or right wing. If left wing populism is populist which aspires to pr protect social justice and to be against social exclusion, to take the two most obvious mm -hmm. uh, aspects of what, is, what would be d distinguish it from the right-wing populism, then still there is the problem that uh, if you build a politics on the idea of, of easy solutions, then that's not enough. So I think for emancipatory populism, or what some might call left populism, to be successful, uh, there has to be a protection and not only protection, there has to be an investment of hope uh, uh, in the idea that it is, it is good. It's a good life to be a citizen. It's good for us to meet and share our political uh, challenges and responsibilities. That this is good life that we do. So politics is not there to just overcome the difficulty of this moment. Well, it's there as an enriching part of being human. So I think that would be uh, an, an enriching also in the sense that it is there, but it is there for us to broaden our horizons, to, to, to make solidarities with the people we don't know possible, and how that is uh, you know, good for each and every one of us, that we can share more, understand more. These things that, that so I, I see, and maybe this is old style, uh, you know, humanism, uh, romantic enlightenment idealism, but I think it's, it, there's a, uh, a trust in the, in, in the willingness and the value for all of us to aspire to grow and not to reduce ourselves. So I think maybe this is where I would sort of locate the difference between right-wing populism and, and if you call it left populism or emancipatory populism that there is, if we call it an anthropological optimism, mm -hmm. that, that people can grow and people want to grow. And the best response to a difficult situation is not just to get rid of the difficulty, it is to take responsibility together with others in this difficult situation. So the more we see that uh, uh, happening and coming to life, 
in these movements, the, the happier I'll be. But I have to study the, this is mine, this is a bit from afar, and I have to study the details and the practices to know more. We are all interested to see what they will achieve, and that's the, the, the interested raise in, uh, in the uh, academic uh, community. Let me also say that, I, I mean, these are things, but we also have, I think, across Europe, uh, less visible than, than these successful movements of Southern Europe. There is a growing uh, movement of uh, an autonomy movement, or a kind of large movement. We have in all corners of the world, also in, 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 in the Nordic countries, people who don't express themselves so much in electoral politics, but I think there's movements to build autonomy in terms of, of values, cultural values, in terms of the music and the way of life, uh, autonomy in terms of production of food, uh, you know, food collectives, and you, uh, autonomy in terms of education, or autonomy in terms of, or, or self-reliance is maybe the better word, self-reliance in, in mental care, in health care, all these movements which happen rather under the radar of the media. Uh, it are also, I think, giving hope. I don't want to say things are going well, uh, you know, but I'm, I'm just saying that that very many people who are not very visible politically are actually responding in a deep way to the political and economic and cultural crisis of the times. So it's not only the visible emotional the politics, there's also other things happening which we need to be attentive to. Yeah, probably the reason, a kind of uh, informal formal dialogue between yeah. forms of uh, institutionalized politics yes. and forms of non-institutionalized politics yeah. and then a dialogue between social movements and uh, exactly. uh, non-formal organizations with the uh, political parties and uh, do you think that uh, in that sense uh, this movement could be able to combine uh, what is a traditional um, state-centric European perspective mm -hmm. with uh, a uh, non-traditional, uh, probably Gandhi in that sense uh, was a, a progressive thinker, uh, non-traditional, non uh, innovative, uh, self-help uh, um, form of uh, politics, which is not based on the state, but is based on the community. Yeah, uh, I, think, well, for, I think that's very right, that uh, in order for any explicit institutional organization to be successful, it has to rely on informal resources. The, you, know, you can't create a revolution by, by, by uh, mobilizing one meeting. There has to be a social uh, need uh, and there has to be a social movement that can that is the base and then only can, can the effective institutions inspire. Then there is um, the old dilemma that many people who are with right disappointed with the old left and the institutions created by the old left are so anti-state and anti-institution that somehow it's so for difficult. This is, I think, one of the real reasons for the failure so far of the responses of the green and left movements in Europe to the crisis that neoliberalism has brought, that we have not been able to form the coalitions we need between those who know how to organize and build institutions, but don't, don't have the radical cultural political aspiration, uh, you know, old-fashioned left, uh, uh, and then we have the, the new radical groups who uh, are so allergic to institution building and electoral politics that they will never touch it. So this is the coalition, uh, this is the European, European situation, and uh, maybe in other parts of the world, like Am Army, I think one of the very interesting aspects of, of AAP, Am Army Party in India, is that, uh, uh, you know, when it started happening, uh, my the people I know in India from the, uh, from the uh, uh, National Alliance of People's Movements and the Adivasi Movement and the Gandhian Socialist Movements were lukewarm, didn't know whether to join. At the end of the day, and still many, not all my friends are there, but what happened was that I think the division between movement politics and party politics uh, is less clear in India. People from movements have joined Ahmadmi, people from the parties have seen have seen more the need to rely on the resources by social movements. So maybe that's one thing that also uh, maybe this very delicate and difficult balance Podemos has, of how to enter electoral politics. Again, the same thing. 
how can we both be a genuine social movement and then also uh, take part in the effort to tame and direct state power through elections. So I think new experiments which are very important are happening uh, before our, our eyes in these two countries and maybe other countries as well but at least in these two. So um, again it's very interesting and I hope to learn, learn a lot about this next years. Probably Podemos, uh, sorry, Syriza is, uh, is advancing in this internal dialogue of the left having co a coalition of different uh, forms of uh, relating with institutions and uh, social movements and uh, I would say that we are in a transitional moment also in Italy where the institutionalization of the Five Star Movement yeah. in the Parliament is changing the movement from inside, so this is something that... Uh, you see, I think that it's interesting that the Five Star Movement, at least in, in my context uh, of, of politics, mainly uh, Finnish, but also some other places, uh, I think the Five Star Movement is the riddle. Uh, but people I know I somehow have this positive curiosity about Syriza and Podemos and Marvi, Five star movement, people are more hesitant. We don't know what it is. And maybe that's also very nice that we don't know what it is. Italian politics is difficult for outsiders to understand. Yeah. Uh, I, I would have a last question for you. Yes. If you agree, uh, the question is what do you think Europe can learn from the world? Well, um, uh, I suppose still the most essential lesson for Europe is that. Uh, and I think of myself, I come from the Nordic, from the Nordic welfare state. I was born at a time when the welfare state was expanding. I grew up with the idea that what we are doing is a good thing. And I do think the Nordic welfare state, the caring state, the democratic the universal welfare system, has many very good sides. There's a lot of pos well, positive things to learn. But in the Nordic countries and in Western Europe as a whole, there's still not enough recognition of the dependence of our success on exploitation of the South and of nature. We still think, many people in the Nordic countries think somehow that our enormous wealth is justified. We see it's not, and it's, it's a result of 500 years of very brutal, very ruthless exploitation. So I think and this is a big lesson for, for I think for the for globally, not only for 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 Nordics, that I think it's simply. I mean, it's almost a fact. At least it's a political issue to take very seriously that this the kind of success that we had in Nordic countries in terms of democracy and welfare was always more dependent than we would like to acknowledge, on on violence and brutality that, that was exported to other continents and to the future and to other species. So there I think to know ourselves we need to be more, uh, we need to rewrite the history of our, our own success. That's at least one thing. Thank you very much for uh, this interview. It was really inspiring and uh, see you at the next uh, Alice interview. Thank you. Thank you Alice for being here.